Hi, I'm John Schreiber. For 15 years, the New Jersey Performing Arts Center has been the state's premier home to both world-class and community-inspired performances. We pride ourselves on presenting something for everyone, and that's why we're proud to partner with the Caucus Educational Corporation to bring you conversations at NJPAC. This groundbreaking new series will feature some of the very best talent New Jersey has produced, along with many of the state's key leaders. We're pleased to welcome them, and you, to the Arts Center. Funding for this edition of Conversations at NJ Pack with Steve Adubato featuring Governor Chris Christie has been provided by Health First New Jersey, New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group, Auto Insurance, Homeowners Insurance, and Banking under the principle of stewardship. TD Bank, NJ Best, New Jersey's 529 College Savings Plan, turn a dream into a degree. Josh S. Weston, The Fidelco Group, Roche, Barnabas Health, The New Jersey Education Association, working for great public schools for every child. Cone Resnick, providing accounting, tax, and advisory services for more than 90 years. And by New Jersey Natural Gas, proud to support education in our communities. Additional support provided by our media partner, the New Jersey Performing Arts Center. This is One on One. That's good acting, yeah. <laughs> I'm a boy, I'm I get that a lot. I go to Atlantic City all the time, like, are you the guy? I go, no, I'm not. This is one you can't afford to miss. They thought that I wouldn't survive it, but I knew I would. Welcome to Conversations in NJ Pack. I'm Steve Adubato. This is Governor Chris Christie. How you doing, Governor? Doing great. Just to make sure everybody knows we're in front of a live audience, I think applause would be appropriate. <laughs> now, Governor, we are taping this program um, after a whole range of really important things. When we, it's interesting, when we agreed to do this, a lot of things hadn't happened. One of the biggest was, uh, Hurricane Sandy. Right. Let's get right into it. The biggest impact the hurricane and its aftermath has had on, frankly, you as a person and you as a governor. Well, I'll go reverse. As a governor, it, um, it's consumed my job. You know, when you're governor, you have a lot of things that you plan that you want to do, and then other things that are kind of foisted upon you by the legislature or by outside events but none of them really ever consumes all of your time. You can figure out a way to, to handle them, to be able to do multiple things at once. What this has really done, at least for the last um, number of weeks, eight weeks, nine weeks now, has been just to consume the entire governorship. And so uh, that's a different sensation for me uh, over the last three years. And so as a governor, that's what's done for me. As a person, uh, it's given me, I think, an even closer connection to the people of the state. I, I think Governor Kane told me this when, when um, during transition, I had a number of meetings with him where he taught me how to be governor. And um, <laughs> one You're of not the joking, things, are you? I'm not joking, no. <laughs> I'm not joking at all. Um, and, and one of the things that we talked about was the unique connection in New Jersey that New Jerseyans have to their governor because of our constitution, because of our system of government of not electing other people statewide, you are truly the one unifying or divisive figure in the state you know, from, a, from a public affairs perspective. Uh, and so there's always a special kind of connection between a governor and the citizens in this state that may differ in some respects um, with our other states in the country. That's now become, I think, even more profound for me personally in the aftermath of the storm. Uh, I think. I feel much more connected to the people of the state than I did before, and I think for many of them, they feel much more connected to me because of the shared experience that we're all having. Now, we're taping this program at the New Jersey Performing Arts Center just a few days before the holidays. This will program will air after, and we'll repeat it, and, and uh, I, don't, I have a feeling we're not gonna date ourselves. But Governor, go back a little bit. There was a scene of the many scenes. Um, I believe it was the day before President Obama met you and you met a lot of people face to face. But it, there was a scene, and I know there's a picture that we're gonna put in post-production, that it just, it just stuck in my mind because it was on 
in newspapers across the country. I believe you were in Perth Amboy, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong. There was a woman, either Sayreville or Perth Amboy. Sayreville. Sayreville. And you know who I'm talking about. This woman was literally, she had lost everything, she was saying. She was literally holding you, saying, Governor, I've lost everything. There's nothing left. There's nothing to live for. Do you know the woman I'm talking yeah. about? Why does she stand out, and what were you thinking in terms of what you could do as governor to deal with it? Because you couldn't fix her problem. She, you couldn't get her a house back. No. Uh, and, and she's really looking for you to do that. That's the first thing you need to understand, I think, as a leader. If she's not expecting you to come in there as much as she might like you to and wave a magic wand and make it all go away. But I think what people are most fearful of at that moment is being forgotten. And, and I think the presence of the governor in her neighborhood, and if, if you saw the whole scene of it, mm -hmm. she took me by the hand and walked me into her house, at which the, the state police were thrilled about. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and when I said, they said, you really shouldn't go, I said, we're going. And I went into her home, and she was showing me. Everything was ruined in the house. Uh, the smell in the house was awful. And uh, she, what she wanted me to see what had happened to her. And I think that what she's really looking for is to make sure, and she accomplished what she wanted to make sure of, that I would never forget her, or the people in her neighborhood. And so I think that's what people like those folks, and believe me, she was a unique personality, but she was not a unique person in what I experienced in the first two weeks after the storm. I had a repeat of that in Belmar, in, um, in Seaside Heights uh, and other places around the state uh, where Port Monmouth, uh, where you know, people had that same type of reaction and wanted you as governor to see it. But they also want you to hold them. They want yeah. you to hug them. They want you to, I know the word comforter or consoler in chief is being used a lot these days. Did you see yourself when you were the chief prosecutor for the federal government which you were never seen as the consoler in chief as. No. <clears throat> I never remember you that no, way, Governor. No. Um, <laughs> did, how did you, how does anyone, but particularly you, because you have that reputation of being so tough, so aggressive in that prosecutorial role, in that role, you were physical, you were holding them, touching them, you were whispering in our ear. And I remember I asked you something off camera about this as to how you were prepared. And, I, and if you, do you mind, it's too late, I already yeah. asked you publicly what you were thinking as to what you needed to do and who told you how to handle it. Do you remember that conversation? Well, yeah, I think it's a, it's, it's a combination of two things. Um, one of them is just to, to address the, 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 the part of the question about your personality, right? My personality as the prosecutor. Um, the fact is that's, that's what I had to do as prosecutor. Um, but no one should ever be fooled that they know someone's complete personality in public life. You know, you use those portions of your personality which you need to to be able to do your job effectively. Uh, but, you know, my, my family, I think much like yours, is a hugging family. And so I grew up in an atmosphere where I never wanted for hugs. And it was, in case we ever forgot, required. You know, I mean, like, mean? If I, well, like if I came home from college and as I did many times for a weekend or for a break and and I thought I was just a little bit too cool because now I was a college guy and Tell folks I meet my parents at the University of Delaware. I'd come home and if I didn't hug my mother and my father when I walked in, it was an immediate conversation. Like what? Come over here. You know, I get a hug. That's the way it goes. So part of that personality. You're that which, way with your kids, aren't you? I, absolutely. My wife and I are both like that. And because she grew up in a family very similar. Um, and so the expression of emotion in that way is something that that comes very naturally to me. And in fact, being the prosecutor was the unnatural part. In the sense that withholding sometimes that emotion, which you couldn't display publicly as the prosecutor, um, was more difficult for me than what I was doing um, as the governor most recently. Secondly, I got a great call the night of the storm, an unsolicited call from Governor Jeb Bush. And um, Governor Bush had obviously gone through a few of these uh, in Florida during his time as governor. And one of the things he said to me was, um, he said, people will want to see you and they're going to want you to console them and you can't be afraid to do it. 
He said, you can't be afraid to do it because you may not understand how much comfort you bring to them at that moment, but I'm telling you, it is indescribable. And you won't understand it completely, Chris, until you go through it. But I'm telling you, that's what you should do. Mm. And he said, and I know that's you anyway. Be yourself. Don't think you have to act like the governor and be stiff. He said, just be yourself. Mm. Two seconds on the fleece. <laughs> yeah, well, listen, I mean, the, the fleece, as, as you know, has a connection to your family um, because um, the, the fleece was given to me um, the day after the election in November 2009 by Steve Adubato Sr. And, uh, and this is typical Steve Sr. because um, he didn't know I was coming to the, to the uh, Robert Treat Academy the day after the election. In fact, we, we, none of us from the campaign went to sleep that night on election night. Oh, no. We stayed up all night, night, right? right. And, and then um, the next morning, we all kind of look at each other, sitting in the hotel at the Parsippany Hill and say, all right, you're governor-elect. Now what the hell do we do? Um, <laughs> and you, you should do something today. Where do you want to go? And I said, uh, I thought about it for a couple minutes. I said, I want to go to Newark. You didn't win Newark. No, I know, hardly. Um, <laughs> Do you know I mean, Governor King got 60% of the vote? Yeah, Mark? I know. Did you know that? Yeah, I'm aware. Me, I'm aware. You were... yeah, he told me that during those, those lectures. <laughs> I got <from> him. <laughs> Do you know but, he got 71% of the vote in 1985? Yes, I'm well aware. <laughs> People are reminding me of that this year. Um, and and that, so I decided I wanted to go there. So that was at about 10 o'clock in the morning. We called Steve and, and asked if we could come. And he said yes. And we got there at about, I don't know, 12 o'clock noon or 1 o'clock in the afternoon. It was very early. The kids were still in school. Um, I got there, and we went into a conference room first. And uh, we sat down. It was myself and, and uh, the lieutenant governor, and Mary Pat and uh, Andrew and Sarah. Uh, two and, of your kids. Uh, yes, two of my two oldest children. And uh, Joe D. was there. Um, and Mayor Booker was there. And uh, Steve comes out from, like, underneath the table <laughs> with this fleece <laughs> in a package that says Chris Christie Governor on it. And, with and a I, couple stars. A couple stars on it, right? And, and I looked at him and I said, you are the best. I, had, I said, seriously, where did you find a store to do this this morning? <laughs> and he said, are you kidding me? I, I knew you were going to win. And that's why I got this. And I said to him, where's Corzine's? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> <Give me. laughs> that's no joke. <laughs> I said, give me... Give me his, too. You're, you're a smart politician. I know you got one for him, too. But that's where the fleece came from. And so when I first started wearing the fleece um, during Hurricane Irene a year ago, and uh, it didn't get nearly as much attention back then, but I wore it because it, it, it was warm and it was comfortable. And it, so I just grabbed it out of the closet. It was not any kind of thought. Well, when this hurricane was coming... Right. I'm, a, I'm kind of a, a superstitious person, too. And I thought, well, things went pretty well in Irene, so don't mess around. Grab the same fleece. So I went in and grabbed the same fleece and put it on. And all of a sudden, this fleece has become kind of, you know, infamous. And, and uh, my wife, of course, who's the capitalist in the family, um, she wants to auction the fleece off <laughs> for the Sandy Relief Fund. I heard she's um, getting 25 plus, 25 grand plus. She thinks she can do better. <laughs> <laughs> and I said to her, you know, I, 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 if she gets the right price, I'll turn it over. I'm well, not sold yet on 25000 I think they And tell folks better. where the money will go? To the Sandy Relief Fund here in New Jersey. Um, and, in fact, she and I were together earlier today, uh, and uh, she had come back from, from the, the headquarters of the Relief Fund, and they have now raised over $25 million. Yeah. <laughs> um, Switch gears, but uh, connected still with Sandy. On NJ.com, um, there's actually an interesting dialogue going on. We ask people, what would they want to ask you? Many of the questions have to do with rebuilding. One of the themes that keeps coming up is, Governor, given this storm, given the storms that we've had, unprecedented storms, storms that you said, stop with the 100 years. Yeah, it's over. I, everyone's a 100-year storm. I've had 300-year storms in three years. So. Right? <laughs> Anyways, pretty much we should talk, stop so, talking like so that. So I, I, I don't want to do a lot of public policy, but this is an important policy question. How much sense does it make? I mean, you, I know you love the Jersey Shore. I love the Jersey. We love it. How much sense does it make to go back down there to rebuild the Jersey Shore, given what we know about those storms, the impact of those storms, and the fact that we simply can't afford to do this again? That's what a lot of people are asking. It it's a, a good lot, question. It is a good question, but there's a very easy answer. It makes a lot of sense. It, it depends on how you do it. Now, what you'll find at the Jersey Shore is there's been a great debate over the years 
and, and residents have been involved in this debate in a, in a significant way about whether the engineered beaches with the large dunes really make a difference. And, and you've had lots of residents who've refused to sign easements to build those large dunes because it blocks their view. Well, we're in Lavalette and you home. can't see anything. Right. But that's good because? Because in the towns along the shore where they had the, the Army Corps of Engineers engineered dune systems, you had the least amount of damage. In the towns where they had not done it, you have nearly complete destruction. So there's no longer a debate about whether these systems work or not. They work. And for the people who don't want to sign easements to build the dunes because they block their view, they don't have a view anymore because they don't have a house anymore. So it would seem to me at this point, you can make a choice. Sell your property because the, the view is that important to you. So if I have to give it up, then I'm not going to have the house. And sell the property to someone who has common sense. <laughs> <laughs> and, we'll, and we'll actually, you know, <laughs> allow the government to build the dunes and, and then be able to protect not only your own home, but inland as right. well. And one of the things that I've emphasized to the president in our you know, frequent conversations about the rebuilding of the Jersey Shore is that the dune systems is a prerequisite to anything else we do for, for the reasons that are implied in the question, which is, well, why do it if it's just going to be ruined again? Right. And isn't that throwing good money after bad? Well, not if you build the dune systems. Let's, let's talk about the uh, relationship you have <clears throat> you have a very close relationship, clearly, with... Uh, we'll talk about Bruce Springsteen in a little bit, but, but the other close relationship that you've developed in the last couple months is with President Obama. And it wasn't always so close. Yeah, well, and, and, and I, let's, not, let's not mischaracterize it now. I mean, it's not like we're going out to dinner okay. this, you know, <laughs> well, this well, weekend. I mean, so... But what I, what I think we have is a good working relationship. Okay, but let, let's go right to it. The, the, you, you made it clear that you, you said about John Stewart in an interview you did on Comedy Central. You said, I know guys like John Stewart. He's a wise guy, he's snarky, and in the context of his question, and I'll put it a different way, which isn't so snarky, but it's an interesting premise of his question. The premise of the question was that you questioned President Obama's leadership. Mm -hmm. And Stewart said, hey, wait a minute, you questioned his leadership, and then, when you needed him, he came, and you thought he was a very good leader, and you said good things about him. Many of us, most of us, I would say, would say that was the right thing to do because New Jerseyans needed that help from the federal government. Does your view of President Obama's ability to lead change in any significant way throughout this crisis? Well, sure, but, but you know, People can lead in pods, right? Pods. Yeah, hear me out. What I'm saying is that, that you know, he had and executed very well on leadership during the storm. That doesn't in any way change my view of his failure to lead in the first three years of his administration on a whole wide variety of issues. And this is where I got back and forth with John about it. I, you know, John's view was, well, if he led now, that means he was always a leader. And I'm like, no, it doesn't mean that at all. It means he was presented with an opportunity to lead, as he had been many times before, and in my view, failed, but he succeeded this time. And I want to be clear about why I said what I said. It's not because, oh, uh, I'm trying to be smart and New Jerseyans need the money, so I have to suck up to the guy now. That's not it. I said what I believed to be true at that moment which was that he was showing excellent leadership for the country and for our region in this storm. And my concern about the way other people reacted to that was... Not just other people, Governor, well, well, you're, certain people. Right. You're Republican, and therefore you shouldn't say anything nice about a Democrat within one week of an what election. What do you think of that? Well, it's just stupid. I mean, I don't... The, the fact is that the president came here showed great concern for the people of the state and provided extraordinary help in the immediate aftermath of the storm. And that's what I said. And I complimented him for it. Um, 
I don't know what people really expected me to do. You know, wear my Romney sweatshirt, stand up behind them. I mean, you know, I mean, the president... Did they, did they ask you to do that, Governor? <laughs> no. The, the president and I had, had a, you know, had a very, had very candid conversations while we were together that, that Wednesday. You want to share? I, I mean, I'll just share this one part because I've shared it publicly before. Um, you know, the president and I were talking about the fact that I'd said some very nice things about him um, and, and that, you know, that got some people angry. I said, listen, I'm just doing my job. And he said, well, I appreciate it. And so I, I didn't want to leave him with a misimpression, though. I didn't want to lie by omission. So I said to him, by the way, in the next Tuesday, I'm not voting for you. <laughs> <laughs> and he laughed. Annette, you like that, Annette. Okay. <laughs> yeah, he, Why did you have to say that? Why couldn't you have left it alone? Well, but, <laughs> because, again, I didn't want to leave him with a misimpression. I mean, we were getting along fine, but I didn't want the guy to think I was voting for him. <laughs> Because I, I, I wasn't. And so he laughed and he said to me, believe me, Chris, there was no doubt in my mind about that. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it, what I think people need to understand in all this is that uh, you, you see these people on TV, whether it's the President of the United States or whether it's me, and I think people tend to forget sometimes that these are human beings. And I was in an awful crisis, and someone came to help me and the people that I am charged with protecting. And I'm going to say thank you for that. And if he does it well, I'm going to compliment him for it. And I said on TV, I didn't give a damn about the election at that point, and I didn't. I mean, it doesn't mean that I didn't work hard for Mitt Romney. I did. Up I until that point. Year. Sure. And, and Mitt Romney understood. He, I spoke to him the day before the storm hit and told him, if this is as bad as it appears it's going to be, I'm gone. I'm off the campaign trail for now to the election. And he said, of course, you got to do your job. Can we do something on Springsteen fast and then we'll move to other... I can't promise you I can do it fast, but I'll, I'll do the best I can. <laughs> the obsession with mm -hmm. Springsteen started when? Well, it's my first show when I was 13 years old. Because? A friend took me and said, you need to see this guy. Mm. Older friend. Where? Seton Hall, Walsh Gym. Walsh Gym. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 19, December of 1975. What happened in that concert for you? It was over. I was hooked. It was done. So Springsteen is a progressive. Yeah, that's the word they use now. <laughs> <laughs> he watches MSNBC a lot. I, I which guess. Which is a good thing. I guess. It's, it's, yes, he's a liberal progressive. Right. He's, a, he's someone who supports certain causes and that you don't support. Right. And he didn't agree with a lot of your politics. In fact, there's certain people in your band that I happen to know we're trying to tell him about you, and he's like, I don't want to hear it. Right. Yep. But at a certain point after the storm, <clears throat> please just share, Governor, before we go out to this break, there was a thawing, was there not? Yeah, well, what happened was, you know, we were in this emergency operations center um, down in, in, um, in West Trenton, and it's kind of this windowless place where we're every day managing the storm. And one of my staff came running in one night at about... <clears throat> Uh, 11 o'clock, and said, you won't believe what happened. And I'm like, oh, Christ, what now? I, I, <laughs> what next, right? And he goes, no, 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 it's good, it's good. Springsteen was in Rochester tonight, and he gave you a shout-out from the stage. I said, what did he say? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, we owe, we owe so much to our great governor of our state who's, who's leading with such courage. And I said, okay, I need to sit down, right? <laughs> uh, and then he was someplace else the next night and did the same thing. Uh, and you recall they had a telethon um, on NBC, Matt Lauer. Yes. The telethon the first week of the storm, ended the first or second week of the storm. And I got invited over there by NBC to come. And so myself and Mary Pat and the kids went over there uh, to New York. And Bruce was the last act of the, of the show. So after it was over, the president of NBC, who I was sitting with, asked me to come down and say hello to some of the people on the stage. So I was talking to Max Weinberg, who's drummer for, yeah. for Bruce, and, and Steve Van Zandt, um, who's a guitar player and, and on the Sopranos. And so we were sitting talking, I know these guys, and so we were chatting. And then all of a sudden, you, know, you see when people are looking over your shoulder, they're not listening <laughs> to you anymore, and they started to back away <laughs> from me. I'm like, what's going on? I turned around, and Bruce was walking towards me. And he put out his hand to shake my hand. So I shook his hand, and he said to me, come on, give me a hug. <laughs> and um, <laughs> so I, I gave him a hug, and he, he whispered in my ear, it's official, we're friends. <laughs>
Um, this is Conversations at NJ Pack. This is only the first half of a, uh, two half hours with Governor Chris Christie. Now you know why we're doing this series. Uh, thank you, Governor. Stay right there. Don't go anywhere. All right. You got more good stories? Uh, well, we'll see. If you're a good interviewer, I'll have more good stories. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Now let's continue the conversation about this and other important topics and issues on Facebook. Visit my page at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, PhD. Conversations at NJ Pack with Steve Adubato featuring Governor Chris Christie has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence, and by the New Jersey Performing Arts Center in cooperation with NJTV and 13 for WNET. Funding for this edition of Conversations at NJ Pack with Steve Adubato featuring Governor Chris Christie has been provided by Health First New Jersey, New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group, Auto Insurance, Homeowners Insurance, and Banking under the principle of stewardship, TD Bank, NJ Best, New Jersey's 529 College Savings Plan, Turn a Dream into a Degree, Josh S. Weston, the Fidelco Group, Roche, Barnabas Health, the New Jersey Education Association, working for great public schools for every child. Cone Resnick, providing accounting, tax, and advisory services for more than 90 years. And by New Jersey Natural Gas, proud to support education in our communities. Promotional support provided by The Star Ledger and NJ.com, Everything Jersey. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area.